record on this. Okay, welcome folks that are listening to this recording. And welcome folks who are here. Let's start with singing. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is your help and salvation. Let all who him now to his temple draw near, joining in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people again, gladly forever adore him. Praise and thanks, Lord Jesus, that we have the privilege and opportunity again to be in your presence as you speak to us through your word, particularly as you bless us with Zechariah, one of the apocalyptic prophets, one of the prophets that you gave eight visions to, and that you sent your holy angels to help us to understand those. May we interpret those and understand those in the ways that you would have us to know and understand those that they were not just given for Zerubbabel and Joshua in their day, but they're given for us and very appropriate for us in our day as well. So as always, be with us and bless us as we gather in your name and as you lead and guide us, fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we might be spirit-filled and joyfully share your message with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First thing, let me take care of just a little bit of housekeeping. I gave to you a sheet that says the Lord relented or repented. And the reason I wanted to do that is the Lutheran Study Bible has some really nice notes. And I found it in the Lutheran Study Bible. So I thought I'd print it out for you. And so um, it's, yeah, you remember back in Joel and in Jonah, where it kind of talks about that the Lord relented and we said, changed his mind. And I said, no, God never changes his mind. You recall that at all? No? All right, forget it. No, no, I no, we we did talk about that. All right. And and I know that uh, sometimes that that's a hard thing to, to pick up. And I had said at the time, what if God would change his mind? I kind of had in the sermon this morning, too. You know, what if my prayer canceled out your prayer? You know, what if what if you know I could do that? You know, sometimes people say to me, Hey, Pastor, would you please pray for rain? Your prayers work better than mine. No, they don't. I don't know what you're talking about. Absolutely not. All right. But anyway, so I thought this was helpful. So the actual Hebrew word that's that's used in Joel and, and all these different places, and you got a whole bunch of references there, is nakam. And the root is comfort. Isn't it wonderful that God, as he relents or sometimes translates repent, means that he comforts us? So the first thing. This is a metaphor, all right, uh, something to help us understand uh, something about God, a metaphor of the Lord changing a previous pronouncement of judgment. So God had in, well, let me just start off with, um, God said at the Sinai covenant, if you obey, blessings. If you disobey, curses. So we always obey. No, we disobeyed. So what was his judgment? Curses. But see, he relented of that judgment and made Jesus possible for us. He didn't change his mind, but he relented or repented. All right, so he has um, changed a previous pronouncement of judgment because he has taken care of things. Metaphor appears at some key junctions. So the flood, I will destroy the whole world because the whole world is, is bad. And then he relented, if you would, and had eight people on the ark, Noah and his family and so on, and saved those and started over, right? The Sinai, I told you about that, and the institution of the monarchy. As long as there is a king on the throne that uh, obeys me and, and uh, follows my, my will, then you will be blessed. David, eh, not so much. Solomon, eh, not so much. All right, Zechariah, you know, and, and, and all the prophets coming down there. Do you get it? Did that change the covenant with David? 
thankfully not. And so that's what this is talking about, all right? God makes promises, and you can go to the bank on those promises. But sometimes as he talks about judgments and he talks about um, things that, that are going to be coming, he will work things in a different way. And so he will actually, it sounds like or looks like he changes a previous pronouncement. Jonah, go to Nineveh and say, 30 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. But what did God do? Relented, repented, whatever it was, all right? And because the people repented, then God changed his plans. By the way, was Nineveh destroyed? Yeah, we got it 200 years later because they had turned away and so on and they were destroyed. All right, so we got all that. So anyway, I just, I, I wanted to give that to you. Just, I hope that's kind of helpful for you on, on that. We repent, God doesn't repent. I mean, it's just a bad translation of, of the word that's used there. But God does change a previous pronouncement of judgment, and it's a good thing he does. Otherwise, the soul that sins, it shall die. All right? That's a pronouncement. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Make some sense? All right. Good. I wanted to just add a touch on that because we had we had kind of talked about that before. And I thought, OK, let's let's do that quickly. Let's get to Zechariah. All right. Zechariah. We had a nice introdu introduction to that last time as we talked about Haggai and just a real quick review of history. So we've got in 721 B.C., we have the Assyrians, the 10 northern tribes taken into captivity and all that's left is Judah. Then we have in 597, we have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and some of those taken in the first Babylonian captivity. Then we have in 587, all the rest of the Jews that are taken into captivity, that Jerusalem is burned and, and uh, the temples burned and destroyed, Jerusalem is destroyed and so on. How many years are they in Babylon? 70 years, we know that because Jeremiah tells us that, all right? So they're in Jerusalem for 70 years. Now, most of the minor prophets that we've looked at before Haggai was all before this time. Now, they have come back, 538, they've come back, and because the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, took over the Babylonians, God working in that wonderful way. That's just the whole story there and so on. That now they've come back and with a Zerubbabel and the first group then, we have the first two prophets that are going to be speaking to us as they return. Haggai's the first one. And we've got some dates here and so on. And in after the, the he starts in the sixth month, in the eighth month, then Zechariah comes. So Haggai is speaking and he's talking. Now Zechariah is going to come in and he's going to talk. Why two witnesses? What did Leviticus say? You need two witnesses to verify the truth and so on. And so how interesting. We're going to get this in one of the visions as well, the two olive trees. And, and we'll get that. In fact, that's the, the visual that we'll be looking at. So, all right, in a simplified form, here it is. So the Babylonian captivity, 70 years that are there, the foundation of the temple was laid. You remember that? But then their opposition comes and they stop. Remember, Haggai comes along and says, what you stop for? Keep building. Get there and then build the temple. Take careful note of, and we'll look at that in just a minute. And then um, the foundation finishes then, and they continue to build and so on. Zechariah comes and we get the temple finished. Woohoo! But it's not as good as the old temple, that whole business there. Then we have Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, just time-wise, all right? Just time-wise. And so, uh, again, helpful to kind of get the, the whole big picture in here, okay? Haggai, the message of Haggai came and said, give careful thought. What were they doing? Building their own homes taking care of their own needs. And the temple was still in disrepair. And it was because of the opposition that was there. And so God sends Haggai and says, take careful thought. Why is it that there's been no harvest? 
because you're only worrying about yourself. Why is it that you sow a lot, you try and do a lot, but you receive little? Why is it that there's blight and mildew and hail? Why is it that the temple foundation has been laid but hasn't been finished? And how now, if you do God's will and repent and return to him, you're going to have wine, figs, and olives, but not right now. Take careful thought. Haggai, remember that from last time? All right. We also talked about last time, don't go to church. Be the church. Please, please understand that. That is the key. That, that's a simple way. I'm a simple guy. I like simple things. But think of Haggai as that way. Don't go to church. Don't go just through the motions and so on, all right? But be the church. That's the whole message that, that we have here. And Zechariah is going to come through, and, and he's going to talk about that too. Actually, all of Scripture does, you know? Um, it's, it's not works that, that does it, but it's faith in Jesus. How do you show your faith in Jesus through the works? That's a whole James thing. And all right, so we got that. Good. All right. So let me show to you um, Zechariah. This is eight minutes, a little bit longer, but Zechariah has basically two parts. Let me introduce it. That's why we're doing part one today and part two next week. All right. Basically, chapters one to six that we're doing today, the video is going to say one to eight. Don't worry about it. I'll explain later. But then one to six basically is a section. Two years later, Zechariah writes then basically seven to 14. So half and half. Okay, so just with that introduction, I hope that this is going to work. I'm going to count on this working. The book of the prophet Zechariah. The book is set after the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. And we're told in the book of Ezra that Zechariah and Haggai together challenged and motivated the people to rebuild the temple and look for the fulfillment of God's promises. Now long ago, Jeremiah the prophet had said that Israel's exile would last for 70 years and that afterwards God would restore his presence to a new temple and bring his kingdom and the rule of the Messiah over all nations. The dates at the beginning of this book tell us that those 70 years are almost up. But life back in the land was hard, and it seemed like none of these promises were going to come true. Why? And the book of Zechariah offers an explanation. It has a fairly clear design. There's an introduction which sets the tone for a large collection of Zechariah's dream visions. And that's concluded by chapters 7 and 8. And then this is followed by two more large collections of poetry and prophecy. Let's just dive in and see how the book works. It begins with Zechariah's challenge to his generation to turn back to God and not be like their ancestors who rebelled and refused to listen to the earlier prophets, which landed them in exile. And so now the returned exiles respond positively to Zechariah. They repent and humble themselves before God, or so it seems. The next large section is a collection of eight nighttime visions that Zechariah experienced. And just to prepare you, these are full of very bizarre, strange images, a lot like your dreams. The idea that God communicates to people through symbolic dreams, it's very old. It goes back to the book of Genesis. The dreams of Jacob or Joseph or Pharaoh, these gave meaning to current events at the time, but they also gave a window into the future. And and so Zechariah has his own dreams now, and they've been arranged in this really cool symmetrical design. The first and the last visions are about four horsemen each. They're like rangers patrolling the world on God's behalf, and it's a representation of God's attentive watch over the nations. Their report is that the world is at peace. And in Zechariah's day, this refers to how God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon and bring peace. And so the question now arises, the 70 years of Israel's exile are almost up, is now the time for the Messianic kingdom in Jerusalem? And God responds by saying that he's determined to fulfill those those promises, but he leaves the question of timing unanswered. The second and seventh visions are paired because they're both reflections on Israel's past sin that led up to the exile. So the second vision is about these horns that symbolize the nations that attacked and then scattered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. But then these horns or empires are themselves scattered by a group of blacksmiths, an image for Persia. The seventh dream is about a woman in a basket, and we're told that she's a symbol of the centuries of Israel's covenant rebellion. And then this woman is carried off to Babylon by other women who carry the basket flying with stork wings. This is so strange. 
The third and sixth visions are paired as they're both about the rebuilding of a new Jerusalem. So a man is measuring the city. It's an image of God's promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and become a beacon to the nations who will join God's people in worship. And then the sixth dream is about a scroll that flies around the New Jerusalem, punishing thieves and liars. The idea being that the New Jerusalem is a place that's purified from sin by the scriptures. The fourth and fifth visions are at the center of this collection, and they're about the two key leaders among the returned exiles. So Joshua, the high priest, and then Zerubbabel, the royal descendant of David. So Joshua had been symbolically wearing Israel's sin in the form of these dirty clothes. But then those are taken off and he's given new clothes and a new turban, a symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. And then an angel tells Joshua that if he remains faithful to God, he will lead his people and Joshua will become a symbol of the future messianic king. The other vision is about two olive trees that supply oil to this elaborate gold lamp, which itself is a symbol of God's watchful eye over his people. And these two trees symbolize the two anointed leaders, Joshua and then Zerubbabel, who's leading the temple rebuilding efforts. And God says that success will not come to this new temple if it's the result only of political maneuvering. Rather, these two leaders must be dependent upon the work of God's Spirit. The visions come to a close with a bonus vision from the prophet, and it picks up the themes of the central fourth and fifth visions. It's Joshua, the high priest again, and he's given a crown and presented as a symbol of the future Messiah who will also be a priest over God's kingdom. And then Zechariah closes it all out saying that all of these visions will be fulfilled only if the current generation is faithful to God and obeys the terms of the covenant. And so altogether, these three visions emphasize how the coming of the messianic kingdom is conditional upon this generation being faithful to God, which leads to the conclusion of the dreams. It's another challenge from Zechariah, and a group of Israelites come, and they've been mourning over the former temple's destruction for nearly 70 years. And they ask him, is it time to stop grieving? I mean, is God's kingdom going to come very soon? And Zechariah again reminds them of how their ancestors rejected God's call through the prophets, which led to the exile. And so he challenges them too. He says, this generation will see the messianic kingdom only if they pursue justice and peace and remain faithful to the covenant. So in other words, Zechariah reverses their question. He asks, are you going to become the kind of people who are ready to receive and participate in God's coming kingdom? And that question is left just hanging there. The people don't answer, and the book just moves on. And so we come to the final sections that are very different from chapters 1 to 8. Each section is a kaleidoscopic collage of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. So the first one, chapters 9 to 11, describe the coming of the humble messianic king who's riding a donkey into the new Jerusalem to establish God's kingdom over the nations. But then, all of a sudden, this king, he's symbolized as a shepherd over the flock of Israel, and then he's rejected, first by his own people, but then also by their leaders who are also symbolized as shepherds. And so God hands Israel over to these corrupt shepherds. And it raises the question, will Israel's rejection of their king last forever? In the final section, chapters 12 to 14, say no. It's another mosaic of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. And they depict the new Jerusalem as a place where God's justice will finally confront and defeat evil among the nations. It's very similar to the same themes in prophet Joel or Ezekiel. But then God also will confront the rebellion within the hearts of his own people. He's going to pour out his spirit on them, he says, so that they can repent and grieve over the fact that they have rebelled and rejected their messianic shepherd. The final chapter concludes with the new Jerusalem as the gathering point for all of the nations. And then this city becomes a new Garden of Eden and there's a river of living water flowing out of the temple bringing healing to all of creation. And that's how the book ends. And so Zechariah just leaves you to ponder the connection between chapters 1 through 8 and 9 to 14. And the point seems to be that this future messianic kingdom of the book's second half will only come when God's people are faithful to the covenant, the point of the first half. Reading the book of Zechariah is a wild ride. These visions and poems are full of startling imagery and they do not follow a linear flow of thought. And that's part of the point. It's like history and our lives. It doesn't always fit into neat orderly patterns. 
But the prophets offer us glimpses of God's hand at work, guiding history towards his own purposes. And so ultimately, Zechariah invites us to look above the chaos and hope for the coming of God's kingdom, which should motivate faithfulness in the present. And that's what the book of Zechariah is all about. And that's what the book of Zechariah is. Good. All right. Let's see. Can we... There we go. Okay. And let me stop this one. And there we go. All right. Good. Half of it we're going to talk about today. All right. And then the other half we'll, we'll catch, catch next time. And as, as he told you there, you know, the second half is really very different from the first half, but that's okay. On your sheet. Okay. On your sheet. Zechariah chapter one. Let's start with Verse one. So in the eighth month in the second year of Darius, that's helpful because of what we had before with Haggai. All right. So it's just given us a timeline. All right. So this is Darius is the is the um, the Persian king meets in the Persian and so on that um, are allowing them to come back. So all right. In the eighth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido. And you just pass over that and you say, I can't pronounce the names. I'm just going to skip them. Don't notice on your sheet. Hebrew names mean something. And it's always helpful and interesting. You know, we've talked about um, Zechariah, um, and it's on your sheet there. Zechariah means Yahweh has remembered. So notice, and he's going to say it again a second time, that this is important. So it's Zechariah, God remembers, the son of Berechiah, which means God blesses, the son of Ido. Usually there's only one generation that it talks about so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And so if anything, it ought to catch you a little bit by surprise and saying, why are we talking about grandpa this time? You know, son, dad, grandpa, right? Well, the Hebrew tells us God remembers, God blesses at the appointed time. That's going to be important for Zechariah. All right, because they're going to be asking, as the video did a nice job of that, hey, now that there's peace, now that the Persians have come and the Babylonians aren't here anymore, now's the kingdom coming, right? The messianic kingdom. And they thought that there was going to be peace and then David was going to become king again. So remember all that false idea that they had? So here we got it. At the appointed time, God remembers and God blesses. So very helpful as, as we start off with this. Then, as the Holy Spirit teaches us uh, such a wonderful teacher that's there, actually, Zechariah gives us then an outline of what the rest of it's going to be. So this is Zechariah chapter 1. Let me do verse 2 and then 3. So verse 2, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Well, yeah, you know that from Exodus, you know that from Numbers, you know that from all the, the judges, you know that from all that, right? So the Lord was very angry with your fathers because they disobeyed and didn't lead. Therefore, say to these people, thus declare the Lord of hosts. What's a host? An army. Good, an army. Absolutely. A lot of times we talk about the Lord of Sabaoth. All right, that's in our liturgy. Lord of hosts, it's the Lord of the armies. And a lot of times in the Bible, which army is it talking about when it says the Lord of hosts? Tell me the angels. A lot of times, you know, the, the angels that are there, but this is the Lord of all the armies, Assyrians, Babylonians, Medes and the Persians, coming up, Romans, uh, Russians, Chinese. Uh, all right, you got it? So please note, this is a special name for God. And so when he says, this thus declares the Lord of hosts, the one who's in charge of all things, three things. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Don't be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out, Thus says the Lord, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, well, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, what's a statute? 
A law, commandment. Yeah, very good. So my words and my laws, my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts, did you notice that's the third time, Lord of hosts? Okay. As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. Why are we in exile? Why are we returning from exile? The Lord is dealing with us. So three things. First couple of verses, the Lord is angry. Does he have a right to? Whoa, he sure does. All right. And that's kind of the law part that's there. And so the call continues to be repent, return, return to the Lord, return to your covenant God, Yahweh. And we're going to see that each of the eight visions, not dreams, by the way, we'll talk about that in a minute, but each of the eight visions that God gives to Zechariah for the people, the message is return to Yahweh. And what a gospel promise. Yahweh is very angry. But Yahweh will return to you, but not in anger. He's going to return to you in grace, in love, in forgiveness, in blessing them, and so on. All right? And, of course, how does he return to them uh, eventually? Jesus. Exactly. Always Jesus is the focus. All right? So Yahweh is very angry. That's why Jesus had to suffer and die on the cross. Uh, Return to Yahweh, all right? The Holy Spirit works faith in us to return, and then we have Yahweh will return to you. Great. So this, this um, purpose here. So number two, when did the word of the Lord come to Zechariah? All right, they've returned. It's the exiles who've returned and so on. You got all these dates that are there and so on. By the way, it's about 100 years before Malachi. So if you're doing kind of a timeline in your, in your head, Haggai, Zechariah, our contemporaries, there's 100 years that goes by, Malachi, there's going to be 400 years before Jesus comes. So we got this, this timeline that's going on. We won't worry too much about that. Number three, we just did it. One three is an outline of the book. You've got it right there. All right. So this is what the Almighty, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts says, return to me and I will return to you. Beautiful. How many dreams do you have each night? Depends on the night. All right. All right. I don't remember a lot of my dreams. You know, as I, as I was thinking about that, I remember maybe one or two because I wake up after those dreams, but I know I've had other ones and so on. So these aren't dreams that God is giving to Zechariah. They are visions. All right. And so with visions, then it's, it's a little bit different. And, and that's what we want to be looking at here. So verse seven. On the 24th day of the 11th month, all right, again, giving us a timeline here, the month of Shabbat in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo. There it is again. The Lord blesses, the Lord remembers, and at the proper time. Got it? And it says, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees. All right, all this stuff. So basically, let me do the whole eight of them, and then we'll take them apart. Four horses, four horns, four chariots. Why four? What's the biblical number four about? North, south, east, and west. All right, that's, that's my easy way of remembering it. And so it's a number of completeness, an, an earthly, worldly kind of a completeness, all right? So the number four is a complete thing, all right? So there's four horses, all right, that's enough. There's four horns. By the way, there's four craftsmen. I should have put four up there too. And there's four chariots. We'll get to that in just a moment. The measuring of Jerusalem, Joshua forgiven and restored, golden lampstands and two trees. We already talked about it. Why two? The testimony of two people. All right. Um, the truth is there by the testimony of two people. So the, the two that agree and, and speak and so on. Very important. Flying scroll, woman in a basket and four chariots. Almost sounds like Revelation, doesn't it? You can't read Revelation properly and understand it without first reading Zechariah. 
And you can't read Zechariah and understand it prof properly without reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. Je all right, you get it? And so all of scripture needs to be combined. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to be looking back at, as we look through these visions that God gives to Zechariah, what, is, what has he said in the past? And, and why are these images, what do these images mean because of what he said in the past? All right. So let's start with the first one. So we've got this. He sees a, a man. All right. Now we know it's an angel later on. All right. But it's, it's a man standing among the myrtle trees in the glen. Behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. And they said, what are these, my Lord? The angel talked with me and said, I'll show you what they are. Thank you, angel. Otherwise, I won't know. Right. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. Isn't that cool? There's angels that are out there. You grew up with your guardian angel, right? Didn't your mom tell you that you had a guardian angel? I hope so. Or dad, you know, the angels are sent. Hebrews talks about it. You remember, aren't they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who have been called? So there are these angels out there. All right. And so who are these? Well, there's four of them so that we know that it's complete. All right. And so here they've been. Um, uh, out uh, patrolling the earth. And the angel of the Lord, who was standing on the myrtle tree, said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, the earth remains at rest. Good. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem? How interesting. This angel's asking the question that the people are thinking Is this the Messiah time? Is this the time? Now that there's rest in the world, now the Messiah is coming, right? And verse 13, the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked to me. Huh. So did he say yes or no? He said, Ido. Remember what Ido means? At the proper time. Isn't that the way God oftentimes works? We ask him a question and he doesn't necessarily give us a, a, a right now, but he says, in the proper time, I'll do it at the proper time. Verse 14. So the angel who talked with me said to me, cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this is what you're supposed to tell people. I'm exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem. Is that good or bad? Really good, really good. Because jealousy has to do with love. I'm very jealous for Jerusalem. I want the very best for Jerusalem. All right. So I'm, I'm exceedingly angry with the nations because they're at ease. And while I was angry, but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, I've returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts. And the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts. My cities shall again overflow with prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion. What this is saying is the horses mean strength and might. And the angels who are on the horses are going all around the world and they're saying, hey, there's peace there. They're in control. The myrtle trees, you know what myrtle trees are? Kind of little trees. All right. They're, they're really not big cedar. Uh, they're, they're really not big Lebanon kinds of trees, but they're little myrtle trees. How did the people of Israel feel about themselves? We're myrtle trees. All right. That's the idea. And so the people are, are, are feeling so helpless and so hopeless. And these myrtle trees are, this says, down in the glen. I know, we don't talk about glen. What would we say? Down the valley. So the people are down in the dumps. That's how I'd say it. All right? And so what's God do? The first vision, he sends the angels that come and say, hey, the Lord of hosts knows what's going on and he has sent the angels out and he has seen what's going on and he's going to have mercy on jerusalem where are these people at in jerusalem what are they doing oh war was us jerusalem's been destroyed we can't even get the temple rebuilt and things are not going good and all these things and god sends haggai and zechariah to comfort them now, on your sheet, I should have mentioned that. I'm sorry. But the very, very top, what do I tell you Zechariah is? The cheerleader. The cheerleader. Yeah. Zechariah is coming in, and God's giving to him these eight visions to be a cheerleader. You're down in the dumps. You're myrtle trees. You're down in the glen. You're down in the valley and so on. But I'm coming to 
boost you. I'm, I'm coming to cheer you on to help you to know this. All right. So that's the first one that he's talking about. And we got the horses and so on. Now, what's fascinating to me is a lot of times we see the four horsemen and we talk about the four horsemen. You know, we talk about the apocalypse and we think about revelation and we think about these these uh, angels that are coming in to destroy the earth and, and to do all these kinds of things. In Zechariah, these angels are coming to comfort the people and to say, God knows what's going on. And, and he's come to bless you and give mercy for that. In Revelation, what's happening? The people aren't repenting. The people aren't returning to the Lord. And so the message has to be law. And so we got the apocalypse there. And we've got those horses. Okay? Don't get hung up with the colors of horses. All that means is this angel was in charge of doing this. This angel was in charge of doing this. This angel was in charge of doing this. And Revelation will tell you the black represents this and this and this. Daniel and Ezekiel and others that talk about horses will do that too. Don't worry about it. Okay, that's vision one. You ready for vision two? We got to keep going. There's eight of them. All right. So the second vision, we're still in chapter one, verse 18. And I lifted my eyes. All right. So he's seen this first vision. Now he sees a second vision. Four horns. What do you know about the symbolism of horns in the Old Testament? What did horns symbolize or represent? Powerful nations, powerful bully kinds of nations, influential nations, power and pride and, and all these negative kinds of things. Now, that ties into the book of Revelation. Remember the beast that had the seven horns and there's a little horn that comes out and all the horn stuff that's, that's in Revelation? Well, that's the whole point. So there have been four nations. Well, all right, here he says it. All right. I looked and he talked to me. What are these? These are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So we've had Assyria. We've had Babylon. We've got the Medes and the Persians. We've got the Romans that are coming. Anyway, we've, we've had all these, these nations. Why four? Complete. All right. There's been lots of nations that have come. We don't have to worry about four literal ones, but all right. These nations have come and they've scattered Judah and Israel and Jerusalem and they've destroyed them. But all right. I will show, uh, and the Lord showed me four craftsmen, those who work on horns and take their horns. I don't, can, can you tell what these are? Those are planers. Yeah, very, very good. Somebody thought last night they were mouse traps. Yeah, but yeah, they're 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 planers. You know that that craftsmen use. You know to 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 work on wood and and so on. Silversmiths maybe would be better or. Um, uh, you know, those that, that work with that. So these craftsmen have come. Woohoo! What are these coming to do? Well, these horns that have scattered Judah so that no one can raise his head, these have come to terrify them, to scatter the horns that have scattered you. All right. And so this is good news. These craftsmen, second vision, I am coming to rescue you. I am coming to punish those four horns, if you would, those nations that have come against you. Talking about Jesus. Who did Jesus defeat on, on the cross? Sin, death, and the devil. Do we have any worse kinds of enemies than that? Tie them in with, with what we're talking about here. Okay, keeping going. Third vision, third vision, verse uh, chapter two. So he's still watching, all right? Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. They didn't have tape measures. They didn't have yardsticks, but they had rods. Have you ever read, you know, it's so many rods long and so on? I think that's actually a measurement even today. Is there? All right. Yeah. Those of you who know. All right. Good. But, you know, what they would have, and a lot of times they would talk about the cubit, you know, would be the king's elbow to his, to his all right. And so this measuring stick, all right? So a man with a measuring stick in his hand, I said, where, where are you going? And he said, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. Behold, the angel who talked with me came forward and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, run, oh, say to this young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls. 
well, if you don't have walls, do you need to measure it? No. You get what's being said? Go telling it's going to be inhabited without walls because the multitude of people and livestock in it. Man, it's going to be big. And I will be to her a wall. Woohoo! You're not going to need walls of brick and stone and so on because God is their wall. God is their strength. That's right, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. So he sees this person going to measure, and the angel says, nope, stop. You don't need to measure Jerusalem because Jerusalem's going to be so big, and it's going to be including so many people that it's not going to need walls because God is our protector and the one. Isn't that comforting? You hear the cheerleader, rah, 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 all right? Here he is, Zechariah doing it. Then we get, all right, so verse six, up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. The land of the north, the Assyrians and the Babylonians would come from the north to come down and, and get them, all right? So flee from them, all right? Uh, for I have spread you abroad as a four winds, declares the Lord, up, escape to Zion. Everybody come on back to Jerusalem. For thus the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent to the nations, will plunder you. He who touches uh, who touches you touches the apple of his eye. This is one of the places in scripture that, that talks about that. What's the apple of your eye? The special person. A lot of times the firstborn child is the apple of our eye. All right. Conley was the apple of my eye during college and, and so on, you know, my girlfriend, my sweetheart. All right. Don't listen to her. All right. So here it is. God speaking about the apple of his eye. Beautiful. Behold, I will shake my hand over them. This is interesting. So what are warriors doing? They're fighting with swords and so on. What does God have to do? Just shake his hand over them. And he's, and he's got him taken care of. It's just, it's almost funny. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and these shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that, here it is again, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, all right, the one who's over all the armies. The Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come, I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. He already said that. He's going to be there. I will return to you. I will dwell in your midst. Aren't you glad? And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. You shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and again choose Jerusalem and so on. The Holy Christian Church. That's what he's talking about here. All right. So the Lord inhabits. And so where is the church? Wherever Jesus is, where Jesus' word and sacraments are, that's where the church is. And the church's people and not a build. All right, all that stuff. That's what he's talking about here. Okay. Fourth vision. We're not even halfway done yet. So the fourth vision. This one is especially helpful because what does Satan mean? The accuser. What does Satan love to do? Accuse us. What does Satan love to do? make us worry and remember all these terrible things that have happened. Even though we've confessed him, even though we've gotten forgiveness, still he comes. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. This is a vision now, all right? Keep in mind, Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel are the two leaders. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, who's standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing in the, at his right hand, to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments, and the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken away your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. What does Jesus do in confession and absolution? Takes away our filthy garments and gives to us clean robes of righteousness, right? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses. All right, you get all this? This is the imagery that's here. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. 
Now, he is the high priest, and the turban was the piece that um, had holy to the Lord engraved on the turban, and the turban then was the representative. Joshua, the high priest, represented the people, and so were the people sinful? Did they have dirty clothes? Absolutely. So what's God going to do for the people? Same thing he did for Joshua. He's going to take their sins away and give to them clean robes. What happens in holy baptism? Clean robes. That's right. We have clean robes. I love this picture because it has kind of a modern day person, you know, who's there. And Satan is always accusing. But when we are accused, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's, um, I, I think that's in Hebrews or whatever it is that's there. And so this wonderful message, and I love this, this picture. You've seen it many times and so on. But, um, you know, here it is actually covering up his dirty clothes. Or he doesn't take those off. But see, I have taken away your sins, it says. Here's the clothed in righteousness and I will put rich garments on you. Fourth vision, comfort, cheerleader, woohoo, absolutely, all right? And so here we've got it. So we've got this Joshua who represents the people and so on, and we've got clean clothes that uh, we have on him. All right, so we've got all of that going on. Um, then he kind of talks verse six. He picks it up in, in chapter uh, three, verse six. The angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring you the branch. Who's the branch? Jesus. Behold, the branch is growing of loveliest form and grace. Christmas song and so on. Jesus is the branch, all right, from the stump of Jesse that's coming up and so on. Now, if you, Joshua, keep all these things, you're going to be blessed. And then he says, but I'm going to send to you Jesus, the branch. If you do this, I'll give access to that and so on. But now hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men, uh, are men who are assigned. I will bring you my servant, the branch. If you put crosses next to verses that tell you specifically about Jesus, you ought to have a cross right there. This is Jesus, absolutely, as he's there. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes. That's strange. Why seven? Complete. Why eyes? They see things. Does God see everything? Why seven eyes on a stone? Because God sees all things. All right. So he knows what's going on. He sees all things and so on. And so I'm going to set before Joshua a single stone with seven eyes. God, all seeing all those things. And I will engrave its inscription. Now I know Zechariah doesn't tell us. But you know, because of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, what did I say was engraved on the turban? Holy to the Lord. So when God looks at us, because we're clothed in the garment of righteousness, what does he see? Holy to the Lord. What does he see with his seven eyes? You get all this imagery that's being talked about here? So even though you're sinful, know that your sins have been taken away. The cheerleader telling the truth and, and giving the, the good news. All right, engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. What single day was that? Good Friday, very good. Good Friday, that's right. It is finished, he said, right? I will remove that in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. What's the deal about under his vine and under his fig tree? Old Testament, prosperity. Thanks, Conley. Yeah, it's prosperity. Things are just going to be a blessing for you. And so that was the whole thing that was there. All right, got to keep going. Number five. All right, so vision five. So the angel who talked with me came again and woke me. 
all right, my bad sense of humor again is, is kind of funny, all right? So here he's had four visions. He's so tired, he falls asleep. And the angel has to come and go, hey, hey, hey got a couple more for you. All right, wake up. All right, just fascinating. All right, woke me up like a man who was waking out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? Well, he's been asking that all along. This is strange now. I see and behold a lampstand, a menorah, a lampstand, all of gold. Well, where was the gold menorah? In the tabernacle, in the temple. Yes. With a bowl on top of it, of course, and seven lamps on it, of course, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. There are two olive trees by it, one on the right hand of the bowl and the other on its left hand. I said to the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked, answered me said, don't you know what these are? Again, it's just my bad sense of humor, but why did I ask you? If I knew what they were, why do I ask you? But you know how often God does it, all right? And so I think that's funny. All right, do you know what these are? No, I don't. Then he said, well, this is what the Lord of the Lord said to Zerubbabel. Not by your might, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Do you know that verse? That is so cool. Why is it that I can't get this done? Why is it that I can't change things? Why is it that things are going so bad? Why is it? Go to Zerubbabel and go to this verse. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to do it all myself. Instead of, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Any of you were in church service this morning, know what I'm talking about. All right, take it to the Lord in prayer. This is a cool verse. All right. So here it is. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. He hasn't even explained this thing yet, but he helps us out by the Holy Spirit. Got it. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you should become a plain and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to all. All right, good. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation. His hand shall complete it. Then you will know that I am the Lord and so on. All right. So let's talk about this. This is not the best image, but it's, it's an interesting image that's there. Because who are the two trees? Joshua and Zerubbabel. Interesting. What do they have up here? Where are the two trees? Old Testament and New Testament. Not bad. All right. Not the vision, but not bad. You know, what does the Holy Spirit give to us to empower us with the oil of faith and so on? The words of the Old Testament and the New Testament, all right? Now, the vision here is Joshua and Zerubbabel, God's word being spoken to them. But this isn't too bad, all right? So it says Old Testament Bible, New Testament Bible. It's not real clear, sorry. And then uh, whoever it is, you know, is, is doing all these things. But the point is, will it ever run out of, of oil? No. Don't you wish you had a gas tank like that and had two olive trees? That, yeah, yeah. But the whole point is, is there ever an end to the Holy Spirit coming and filling you? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So who can you always count on? The Holy Spirit never runs out. Always plenty, always enough. And, and why a lamp? Why lights? We live in a very dark, dark world. And what do we need? Light. Yeah, Jesus is the light of the world. All right, we can do all that stuff with it too. All right, good. And so we've got this, this image of, of this, this lampstand and the Holy Spirit, all right? The Spirit pouring in the oil of, of faith and, and um, the, the words of Joshua and Zerubbabel, Old Testament, New Testament in that way as, as we go through here. All right, number six. So chapter five. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is really big, 20 cubits with a width of 10 cubits, huge thing. Then he said, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. Now, that's kind of interesting. Do you remember, was it Ezekiel who was told to eat the scroll? And the scroll tasted like honey, but it was bitter because it had the words of law on it and so on. All right. So we've talked about scrolls before. All right. In Revelation, it's going to be talking about a scroll written on both sides again, too. Ten commandments were written on both sides. 
Ten Commandments being the commands and laws. So this scroll that is flying around and it's written on both sides and it's curses and punishment for those who do evil. Of course, God bless you. Of course, that's what's being talked about here. This is the curse, I'm in verse three, that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and shall enter the house of the thief, and so on. New Jerusalem. Will there be any sin in New Jerusalem? No. So here's the vision again. I'm going to come to Jerusalem. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to... Um, Send my Holy Spirit and the, and the oil is going to be nonstop and I am going to punish and I'm going to get rid of all sin. <laughs> there will be no sin in this new Jerusalem, this, this new kingdom of heaven. You follow it so far? All right, good. All right, so if that's not strange enough, now we get another strange one. All right, so this is number seven. We're getting close. Verse chapter five. The angel who talked with me came forward and said, lift your eyes and see what this is going out. And he said, what is it? And he said, well, it's a basket that's going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in, their, in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. Hey, sorry, ladies. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, what did wickedness look like? A prostitute. Yes, a woman, you're right. But all right, uh, a, a, a prostitute, kind of a Jezebel. Can we say that? All right. A Jezebel. All right. Not every woman did. We're going to get ourselves in trouble here. All right. But yeah, a Jezebel. All right. The book of uh, Proverbs, you know, always en encourages the young man, you know, don't go after the loose women, you know, don't go after those women, but go after wisdom. Right. All right. So uh, we got that. All right. So here it is. Wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden uh, weight on its opening. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women came forward, and the wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork. They lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. And I said, who talked with me, where are they taking her? And they said, back to Babylon. yeah -ha! Don't have her in Jerusalem. Get her back in Babylon. And remember, Shinar Babylon is in the Old Testament, a symbol for all bad things. We'll get it in Revelation. We'll get it later on and so on. Okay. Got to get the last one. And the last one is the four horsemen. But you already know about horses. You know about horses as being the ones that have all power and, and, and the like. But now he looks up and here he has these horses that are coming between two mountains. The mountains were of bronze. The first chariot is red and the second one's black and then there's white and then there's dappled. Don't worry about that. And he said, what are these? Well, these are those four that have gone around looking at that and so on, represented the chariot with the black goes to the north and the other one south, the east, west and so on. They go patrol the earth. Behold, those who come to the north country have come and what God is in control and he knows what's going to be going on. Zechariah is coming to comfort the people and say, I'm in charge. I've got things. So what he does then is he crowns, finishing up chapter six now, he crowns um, Joshua, the high priest. No, I'm sorry. He, he comes and crowns Zechariah. Get it right. Zephaniah, Zephaniah who is the one who is the 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 follower of Jesus, the, the one who's going to be Jesus. And so this crown who comes, um, the house of, of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, take from them silver and gold and crown, set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. All right, I'll get this straight. Prophet, priest, and king. Who? Jesus. Joshua's the prophet. Zechariah is the priest. And Zerubbabel, thanks. I know it was a Z. I just couldn't get it. Zerubbabel is the king at this time. So what's this all pointing to? Jesus, who would be prophet, priest, and king. And so this crown that's placed on Joshua's head by Zerubbabel and the people and Zechariah writing this is all pointing to the answer is always 
Jesus. So now you got the eight visions. The eight visions are all about Jesus. And they're all about God remembers, God brings comfort, and he does it in his time. All right? Remember all that for next week. Actually, we'll, we'll kind of go over that a little bit more next week. But we're going to build on that then, all right? So chapter 7 and 8 kind of reviews what we've talked about. And then 9 through 14, whoa, all right, we're going to. We're going to go through that too all right, uh, for next time. Wonderful words that are there. Okay. Um, uh, for, for those that, that weren't here earlier on, what I'm, I'm seriously thinking about is for the next trimester that will start in September is to do the book of Romans and, and to do a, a, a study, a, a deep study in the book of Romans. If you have a different idea and uh, would like something different, I'm still open to that, but I need to decide pretty quickly what it is so that uh, we can advertise it. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. Let's pray. And 1037 folks need to get going. Praise and thanks, Lord Jesus, for your prophets, each and every one of them. And especially this morning, thank you for Zechariah. We thank you especially for the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit came through Zechariah, gave him those visions, these angels, and, and gave the interpretation of these visions. And, and for all of your scriptures, for all of the books of the Bible that you give to us, so that we may be comforted. May we be Zechariah's. May we be cheerleaders. May we bring comfort, your words of comfort, that you do remember and you do care, but it's in your time as we share that message with others. Bless us as we continue to be a blessing and as you work in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I stop sharing and we can stop recording. All right. Bye, folks.